Now, from Southwest Florida's news leader, this is Wink News at 11. New tonight on the Wink News Night Beat, a bone-chilling connection between the confessed gunman of the Stoneman Douglas massacre and a teen accused of sending these threats on social media. Plus, doing everything they can to stop beach erosion, how some homeowners are now facing legal problems for trying to save their beach. And the search for a pet killer who murdered a man's dog in his own home. Wink News, the weather authority. Weather authority, and it finally rained a little bit today. Viewers in Collier County sent us this video of the long-awaited drizzle. Meteorologist Zach Malak joins us now. And Zach, what can we expect for a waking up on Easter morning? Yeah, Brittany, your wake up forecast tomorrow, partly cloudy, pleasant. We are rain free for your Easter Sunday morning. Even a few areas can be mostly sunny. That is a very nice start to a very pleasant afternoon, but rain showers actually can pop up in your afternoon. We start in the mid to upper 60s tomorrow morning with a sunrise at 719. And again, rain showers can return as early as the late afternoon to early evening. I'll map out where exactly we can see those rain showers and what's in store for the full work week ahead coming up. All right, Zach, thanks. Open during construction. That's the big message businesses and the city of Cape Coral want you to hear as the construction continues on the 47th Streetscape project, even though you see street blocks like these. But a new round of roadwork brings more obstacles to reaching your final destination as these images from the Week News Drone show you. And take a look at this map. Beginning Monday morning, a new detour goes into place at the intersection of Southeast 47 Terrace and Southeast 8th Court. The night beats Oliver Reston joins us live now with the latest. Oliver. Well, John Carlos, business owners tell us all of the road work has already hurt their profit margin. And even though the city put up these signs to try to help folks navigate all of the construction, they say their customers are still getting confused. And now they worry it could get even worse. A major roadway in Cape Coral filled with construction equipment, barricades, and piles of dirt. It's not what Stephen Palmer envisioned when he decided to open a business in downtown Cape less than two months ago. Being downtown Cape Coral, you would expect uh, you know a lot more, a lot more traffic and and people actually paying attention to what's around them, tourists, you know, it's season, rather than just looking at the dump trucks and and uh, you know diggers everywhere. He says the construction project on Southeast 47 Terrace has confused his customers. And people calling offline, not not figuring out how to get here because of the construction. They just say, you know, the heck with it. MapQuest has taken us all over the place. We can't even drive through. But he hopes the short-term loss of profits will result in a more beautiful 47 Terrace in the long run. It's it definitely uh, affects the on-road you know on-road business. But you know you got to do what you got to do. City's got to do what they have to do. Now many are hoping customers will navigate the roadblocks. As far as businesses and stuff like that, I think. Uh, People in the Cape know where the businesses are and those are just back ways to get to the businesses. It's a little controversial, but as long as they stick to the deadline, I'm fine. Now, Oliver, is the city doing anything to help these businesses? Yeah, John Carlos, project officials tell us they're trying to minimize the impact on businesses by working just a, f a few blocks at a time. Where we're standing here at the intersection of 47 Terrace and 8th Court, they say should only be closed for a few weeks for this construction. All of the businesses here will be open throughout. Live on the Night Beat, Oliver Redston, Wink News. Now. Oliver, thank you. Later, bar hours become a reality in Cape Coral tonight. The new ordinance goes into effect at midnight. However, no bar owners applied for the special permit to stay open until 3 in the morning. City Council voted recently to let downtown bars stay open until 3 on Fridays and Saturday nights, but not everyone is interested in the extended hours. I think it's nice for like some of our uh, hourly employees who get off work around maybe 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, uh, they have a little more options of what they can do. Yeah, hopefully it's not to extend the hours for people that have been you know, out since about you know, 6 or 7 o'clock. It's a one-year trial. The Cape tried 4 a.m. closing times in 2016, but voted not to extend that trial run. A house destroyed in a fire. Police are trying to piece together what burnt this home to the ground in Bonita Springs. It happened on Valois Drive, not far from I-75, just before 6 o'clock this morning. Wink News reporter Chris Grisby is in studio now with the details. Firefighters found this home engulfed in flames. Luckily, though, nobody lived inside as owners were trying to sell it. But people living nearby were shocked to see the damage done to their homes from the intense flames. Right now, investigators call this fire suspicious and are working to figure out who or what started the fire.
Uh, they did their investigation. As far as I know, it's still undetermined until they do their report. Once their report is, is given, then they, they give a cause. Now, we reached out to the homeowner of the property. He thinks that someone may have started the fire intentionally. As soon as we get the final report back from the state fire marshal's office about this fire, you can count on Wink News to update you. In the studio, Chris Grisby, Wink News Now. Of oh, course, thank you. New tonight, a Parkland sophomore is facing misdemeanor charges after he made threats on Snapchat. Now, take a look. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas student posted these images on his Snapchat bullets and another photo showing what appears to be a handgun tucked into his waistband, both with threatening captions. Wink News reporter Nicole Linsalta shows us the frightening connection the student has to the confessed gunman of the Parkland massacre. The posting came from a Stoneman Douglas 10th grader. Anyone know Josh at Stoneman Douglas? He's light skin, wears Gucci glasses and jeans that look like a four year old drew on him. Hit me up. He then posted this picture with a gun tucked in his waistband. Catch me out here, expletive. The boy was arrested last week and he was Baker acted. Now, the family of the young man mentioned in the post, Josh, understandably shaken up, they have since hired a Fort Lauderdale attorney named Brad Cohen. Cohen told 7 News the boy who posted those Snapchats plays the violent video game called Fortnite. 7 News told it's the same game Nicholas Cruz played, and the 10th grader called himself Nick Cruz on his video game profile. Police arrested the 10th grader who is now facing a misdemeanor charge of making threats on social media. The family also had to surrender all firearms. The suspect has undergone a psychiatric evaluation. It's unclear whether that student will return to Stoneman Douglas High School. A controversial message on a billboard in Jacksonville is grabbing people's attention. It states bluntly, the NRA is a terrorist organization put up by political action committee Mad Dog Pack. The group says the sign is a response to last month's school shooting in Parkland. I think, uh, you know, it's a little strong to say it's a terrorist organization, but in reality it is. You know. We in America like to deny things. The NRA and any of these mass shootings had nothing to do with them. And in fact, in the Texas shooting, it was an NRA member and former instructor who stopped the bad guy. Mad Dog Pack has been around for just about three months, but that sign just popped up in Jacksonville over the past couple of days. And new tonight, authorities say this man, 29-year-old Jeffrey Tomasulo, is now a former teacher at Stewart Middle. After a 13-year-old told investigators he forced her to perform sexual acts on him at least five times. At first, Tomasulo denied it, but then confessed. Right now, he is held on a quarter of a million dollars bond. When we have a case like this that's so egregious, that an adult teacher in a custodial situation involves himself or herself, in, in any kind of sexual behavior like this, it's, it's as egregious an offense as we can ever investigate. Investigators do believe there could be other victims. A Tennessee man is accused of raping a five-year-old here in Florida. The Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office says Justin Bowen and his parents traveled to visit people they knew in February. Officials say the girl and Bowen were left alone for only a few minutes when he assaulted her. She later told a family member. Bowen at first refused to cooperate, but later turned himself over to HCSO when they issued a warrant. And caught on camera, watch as burglars start a shootout in the middle of someone's home. Three people broke into a home in Riverview in Hillsborough County. They exchanged gunfire with the people who lived there who are suspected drug dealers themselves. Surveillance video captured the whole incident. As you see there, no one got hurt. Deputies later found 1,200 grams of marijuana, several guns, and cash. And the president is taking aim at Amazon on Twitter. As President Donald Trump spends Easter weekend in West Palm Beach, he tweeted that, quote, the U.S. Postal Service will lose $1.50 on average for each package it delivers. He went to call the fake Washington Post as a lobbyist for Amazon and that the company will have to pay up soon. The retail giant CEO also owns the paper. This isn't the first time the president has criticized Amazon. Believe me. If I become president, oh, do they have problems. They're going to have such problems. The White House says they do not plan to take any action against Amazon, which does pay their local and state taxes. However, it does avoid federal taxes through credits and breaks. Battling beach erosion, one of our most precious commodities, washing away. But wait until you hear the lengths some have gone to to protect their property. Plus, 70s. Flashback, do you recognize these actors? We'll take you back in time as Dallas turns 40.
And we have a mild night for tonight. Temperatures back in the low to mid 70s. What's in store for your Easter Sunday morning? Your forecast is coming up. And get ready to take a trip back to 1978. How many Dallas fans do we have out there? Well, to 40 years ago on Monday, the show hit the airwaves and it ran for 14 seasons. 1,300 fans from 40 states and more than 30 countries came to Dallas to celebrate the anniversary, winding through corrals to take pictures with the stars of the show. They also toured South Fork Ranch where the show's exterior shots were filmed. It's just because we've watched on telly for all those years and it's going to be such a surreal moment. It was the cast. Um, it, it was just magical casting, and the chemistry was beyond. There's also a museum at South Fork which highlights the gun that shot JR. That scene became one of the most talked about cliffhangers in TV history. All new fighting beach erosion by any means necessary. The Wink News drone captured these images of Sanibel just this past week. They show how the sand is literally disappearing. People who live on the island tell us in some places the drop off is around three feet. In November, Charlotte County approved a $21.3 million project to fix Minnesota Key. Beach erosion in the area was so bad, homes were teetering on cliffs. But the need for sand isn't just a problem in southwest Florida. This video shows how some homeowners in St. John's County are taking matters into their own hands. Wink News reporter Danielle Avitable explains. Fresh sand dunes are now behind these four Ponte Vedra homes. And you could see fresh tracks in the sand left behind by heavy equipment. This is video given to us by a neighbor. It shows bulldozers pushing sand to their property from another part of the beach. We reached out to Florida Department of Environmental Protection and was told that these homeowners are now under investigation. These are the warning letters the four homeowners were given from the state. It says that evidence shows sand was pushed to create a small frontal dune at the base of an eroded one. And violations of state statutes may result in liability for damages and restoration and civil penalties. According to DEP, homeowners must have a permit to do this, and it must abide by the state's environmental laws. We found that one of the homes in question belongs to the CEO of United Airlines. We went to their home as well as the three others. But no one was home. I think they should be investigated. Dave Dierdrick tells me he doesn't think this was fair for the homeowners to do. The, the thought of they can just go take it, to, I don't, I'm not sure where they took it from, but wherever they took it from, they thought they were, they were able to do that. The homeowners have 15 days from when the warning letters were given to reach out to DEP to set up a meeting. Meanwhile, here in southwest Florida, the city of Sanibel announced earlier this week it is working with a coastal engineering firm to design and permit a project that would dump more sand on beaches. Bringing Easter joy to kids in recovery, hundreds of bikers gathered at the Six Bends Harley Davidson this morning for the annual Easter Bunny Run. Bikers rode to the Golisano Children's Hospital with a police escort. They delivered Easter treats and toys to the kids inside. Many of the bikers say their favorite part is seeing the children's smiling faces as the motorcycles roll in. Pull up and you lose your heart, you Look. cry. I mean, you know, you see that they're really needing it and it's so much of a joy in your heart. But to see a bunch of bikers like this get together for a common goal like that, it's, it's just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The toys collected today helped the hospital resupply its playrooms. And we finally got a little bit of rain today. It sounds like even our Easter Sunday will get some rain. I know that might not be great for plans, but we need the rain. Yeah, and luckily the best part of Easter uh, day, the morning area, we are starting off dry. Warm okay. rain showers, though, for your afternoon and evening. I'll show you that hour by hour coming up. But tonight, if you were planning to take your dog out before you head off to bed, partly cloudy, temperatures in the 60s, and we are actually rather humid across portions of our area. Northeast breeze with us at 5 miles per hour, and your Easter planner, notice 9 a.m., we are starting dry. Partly cloudy, pleasant temperatures in the upper 60s then. By 1 p.m. lunchtime, we will still have that dry sky overhead. Partly cloudy is still on the pleasant side, but temperatures much warmer. Back in the lower 80s come the early afternoon.
We actually have temperatures rising to the low to mid 80s for your highs, but then by 5 p.m., back in the lower 80s once again. A few showers will then be possible and even likely across many of our inland communities and then moving towards the west across portions of Collier County, Lee County, and even as far north as that Charlotte County coast. Main reason we are seeing rain is this stationary boundary. We are seeing this stay overhead of us tonight and into tomorrow. And this is giving a little bit of lift across our area. And that lift is actually allowing the cloud cover to stay with us, as well as those rain showers to potentially pop up throughout your afternoon and evening. But again, we start dry for Easter Sunday morning. Notice that 7 a.m. In fact, some of our communities can actually have a completely sunny sky. So if you have uh, some Easter plans outdoors tomorrow, maybe an Easter egg hunt in the community or at home with your uh, grandchildren or and or children by yourselves, it is going to be very nice. Maybe even brunch outdoors will be pleasant because rainy showers will not be an issue until the late afternoon or so. Seeing them move east to west across Collier County by 4 or 5 p.m., even a few across Lee County across dinner time, we start to see a few more showers stay with us through much of your afternoon and evening. Notice 8 p.m. still holding on to a few showers across southwest Florida. But again, we are starting dry for your Easter Sunday morning. Come the afternoon, noticing temperatures town by town, 85 for Golden Gate, 85 Fort Myers, 83 for Arcadia and Lake Placid, 87, one of the warmer spots expected for Lehigh Acres. And we are still a little warmer than where we were today, 78 for Sanibel, 80 Marco Wineland, a much warmer afternoon for everyone. And if you like the warm air, it actually uh, increases for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Back in the mid to upper 80s, 87 your Monday afternoon, 88 for your Tuesday afternoon, 87 again for your Wednesday. So we are staying on the mild side. We are breezy for Thursday. That allows afternoon temperatures to be slightly cooler. And a few more showers come our way Friday and into next weekend. Overall, the full 10 day forecast showing temperatures staying in the mid 80s every single afternoon. All right, Zach, thanks. Breaking right now, live images from Sacramento. This is a vigil for 22 year old Stefan Clark. Dozens of people started chanting his name just about 30 minutes ago. And we have new details tonight on the death of this father of two. Police officers shot Clark to death as they were looking for a vandalism suspect. Clark leaves behind two boys, a three year old and one year old. Sacramento police say Clark advanced towards them when they fired at him. They later learned Clark did not have a weapon. His family had an autopsy done, and it revealed Clark was shot several times in the back. Wink News reporter Daniel Nottingham shows us how this discovery is now inciting cries for justice. Former NBA star Matt Barnes led a rally in downtown Sacramento in support of Stefan Clark. If they could continue to kill us, and it could be any of us. The night before, demonstrators stood face to face with police in Sacramento during the fourth straight night of protest following the release of an independent autopsy. Stefan Clark's family hired high profile pathologist Bennett Amalu to perform the autopsy. And results released Friday, Amalu said the 22 year old was shot eight times. So you could reasonably conclude that he received seven gunshot wounds from his back. Sacramento police say Clark advanced towards them when they fired at least 20 shots, and officers believed Clark was pointing a firearm. Clark was later found with only a cell phone. Black Lives Matter leader Tanya Faison says the protest will continue until there's change in the city. We are very angry, we're very sad, we're very traumatized. I'm traumatized. In a statement, the Sacramento Police Department says it's waiting for the county coroner's report before making further comment. And we're wrapping up the maddest month that broke brackets, hearts, and most recently glasses. Watch teams leaping to the championship game and more in today's Final Four. Plus, your latest from Dunk City and some Florida stars making major moves still ahead in your sports right after the break. Now. From Southwest Florida's news leader, this is Wink News at 11. A man loses his dog after it was poisoned not once but twice. This is Annabelle. The bag of wet dog food that caused her to go into renal failure and seizures was put before her death was put in her very own backyard. Wink News reporter Sarah Rosario speaks to the heartbroken homeowner or the owner who's demanding justice tonight. 
It's horrible, you know. She's my baby. It's, it's, that's, my, that's my kid. I don't have kids. I come home every day from work, and she crawls on the couch and cuddles with me and sleeps in my bed. You know, she's just my baby. I, I lost a piece of my heart. Memories Robert McCann can't get back after he says his dog Annabelle was poisoned by someone not once, but twice. In both cases, he says whoever it was left a note on his door. Saw the note, so I came out here and started looking through the yard, and right about here was a bag of wet dog food just torn up and... She ate it. McCann says he immediately called police. According to this police report, the note left in the first incident read, shut your expletive dog up or we will. It barked nonstop. The note for the most recent incident says, your dog has barked nonstop for two nights straight. Shut him up. Your neighbors are tired of it. If you can't keep him in, get rid of him. We're tired of it. According to vet records, Annabelle was poisoned by Tylenol in the first incident. But in this latest case, it only lists an unidentified toxin, sending Annabelle's body into renal failure and causing seizures. Three days later, she died. Did you go around and talk to neighbors and say, who left this note on my door? Oh, yeah, I've been around to all my neighbors. I'm shocked. Like, that's devastating. McCann thinks whoever it was threw the bag of dog food over the fence. So I've been doing a walk around my backyard because I've heard that they're throwing the poisoned food over the fences. While police are investigating, they say it'll be very difficult to prove without security cameras and say there's not much else they can do. But Robert hopes to get justice for his Annabelle soon. Well, we want him caught. We want him to leave the neighborhood. And new right now, demanding domestic abuse convicts surrender their guns. New York lawmakers just passed a bill to make that reality. Governor Andrew Cuomo just said previously domestic abusers in the state only had to give up their handguns but could keep other firearms. Supporters of the measure say the passage allows a glaring loophole to be filled. A group of high school students are showing their support for the Second Amendment. While they were in class yesterday, they walked out to take part in a rally. Wink News reporter James Pavero shows us why they say it was important for them to march. We are doing this as a pro-Second Amendment walkout. Some of them are now marching for their rights. And that was one of the original rights that we should have the right to bear arms. Rockledge High School students Chloe Deaton and Anna Delaney brought together dozens of their classmates, holding signs, flying flags. Referencing the Constitution. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The response time for 357 Magnum is about 1,400 feet per second. Some advocating arming their teachers. Freshman Obasi Huffman supports that. I like, want my teacher to get a gun, you know, so they can shoot. While thousands have rallied in opposition to guns, the girls believe they might be the first at any school to bring together their voice. If we would have had six people out here, it would have been a great turnout to me. To have this many is breathtaking, is speechless, it's amazing. 75 students saying more Second Amendment rallies will happen if guns continue to polarize the nation. It was nice. We got to come out in class to support the right to bear arms. We're not letting this go. This was the beginning of a very big step for us. That was James Rivera reporting. The students say the walkout was meant to clear misconceptions about the Second Amendment. It lasted 20 minutes and then the students returned to class. And new tonight, a couple is facing aggravated child neglect charges after a doctor said they tortured the man's nine-year-old daughter. The fourth grader lived with her father, Jesse Piott, and her stepmother, Trish Piott, as well as stepbrother and sister. Tennessee authorities started investigating in January after the girl stole food from a teacher at school. That's when the girl started revealing details of her life, saying she slept in a bathtub, ate in the bathroom, and drank toilet water. A neighbor who didn't want to be identified said the parents treated her differently from the other children. Just when they moved in, um, shortly after, our kids became friends with theirs, but the youngest sibling, she never really came over. She was always doing yard work. She was always out in the yard, sometimes till late at night. Police noticed the thin girl was wearing an ill-fitting clothing and had a shaven spot on her head. The child said that Trish Piott did it after she got mad. Jesse Piott told investigators the child had an undiagnosed medical condition and the family sought help. A 10-year-old is recovering in the hospital tonight after his family says a neighbor's pit bull attacked him. We want to warn you, the images of the boy's wounds could be hard for some viewers to see. Wink News reporter Braden Byer spoke to the child's father about the vicious attack. 
The injuries to 10-year-old Noah Curiel's head are hard to look at, some too gory even to show on television. He got the injuries Wednesday afternoon in North Lauderdale when his dad says his ball accidentally bounced into the neighbor's yard. And he went to the house and knocked on the lady's house and the lady let him into the house and she said she put the dog away but how, some way somehow the dog just came loose and attacked my son. His face is all tore up. Noah was rushed to the hospital with serious wounds to his face, head, and ear. Now the Broward Sheriff's Office is investigating the incident. And so is Animal Control, who says they've been unable to make contact with the dog owner. They didn't answer the door for us either. Did a dog bite a little boy? But did tell us through the window to leave. Okay. Noah's father says he just wants the dog owners to take responsibility and to make sure it's safe for his son when he gets him home from the hospital. I just go there at nighttime and to stay with him, and uh, he looks okay. I mean, the swelling is going down. Um, he's going to need some plastic surgery is what they're talking about. The child is expected to remain in the hospital for several more days. And the president is withholding money from Syria. The State Department confirms President Trump is holding on to more than $200 million in recovery funds. The hold isn't necessarily permanent. Sources say the president wants more info on how the money is being used. The funding is slated for basic infrastructure projects to restore power, water, and roads. Officials say it will be discussed this week. And students are taking over a college. This is them invading the school's administration building. They say they are fed up after years, after discovering years of embezzlement by financial aid employees. Wink News reporter Kim Hutcherson has the details on the student-led protests. What is a true black university and who does it serve? Does it serve the administration who are trying to exploit money and rob the students, financial aid, or does it serve all black people, all black students on this campus? Spurred by revelations of financial misconduct, protesters took control of Howard University's administration building late last week. The group's leaders issued a list of wide-ranging demands and say they won't stand down until the administration addresses them. On Tuesday, a blog post that has since been deleted detailed allegations of financial misconduct at the historically black university. A day later, university president Dr. Wayne Frederick confirmed the scandal. In 2017, an audit found that some employees received more money than their education cost and pocketed the difference. Between 2007 and 2016, some employees received grants to attend classes in addition to having their tuition waived. Annual tuition at Howard runs over $40,000. How someone was able to embezzle so much money from financial aid, why we don't have sufficient housing for the amount of undergraduate students here, and why the administration building has no relationship with the students on campus. Six people were fired after the audit, but students say that's not enough and are asking the university's president to resign. I think that's a fair question to ask, and uh, we, I feel that I directed my team to take the appropriate action. I'm Kim Hutcherson reporting. A daycare's discipline under fire after a mother says her little girl was put in a baby jail for hours. The lesson the family affected wants to share with all parents next on the Wink News Night Beat. And your boating forecast for your Easter Sunday, light chop, not bad for your morning, but when can you expect some rain? Forecast just ahead. And breaking right now, there's an active search for a missing boater on Lake Okeechobee. We have limited details, but we do know at least Florida Fish and Wildlife and Glades County Sheriffs are involved in the search. We'll monitor this for you overnight and have a full update on Wink News beginning at 6 in the morning. Like breaks your heart to think about what your child went through. A mother is forced, to, is forced to watch her child locked up for hours, and now the daycare is coming under fire. But as Wink News reporter Kira Mishak shows us, this isn't the first time this facility has been in trouble. It's supposed to be a place that you trust. Caitlin McKenna's kids have been attending Kitty Corner Daycare and Gardener since November. One of the reasons she chose the center, it's classroom cameras. This week, she did a routine check-in and noticed her daughter was pinned up in a punishment zone called the corral, which is typically used for short-term timeouts. And I was like, oh, you know, I wonder 
wonder what happened. A half hour later, she decided to check back in and noticed Brianna was still in the corral, trying to claw her way out while the teacher sat and played with other kids. At 5 p.m. pickup, Brianna was still in the corral. Brianna's teacher told Caitlin the little girl had bitten another student in the morning. The two-year-old had been in the corral a total of four hours. How long she was putting it was just completely wrong and just excessive. The incident so upsetting, Caitlin reported it to DCF and police. Kansas law even says prohibited child discipline can include, quote, enclosing in a confined space. Oh, it like breaks your heart to think about what your child went through. Now Caitlin's learned Kitty Corner has been in trouble before. During their state inspection in January, several employees were found to be without required training and one classroom had too many kids. This mom now encouraging all parents to check those records before choosing a child care center. And if you see something off, trust your gut. Don't ever think that your complaint or your what you've seen is not big enough to be handled or not big enough to matter because it does matter. Remembering the Parkland victims taken too soon, hundreds of bikers rode from West Palm Beach to Parkland this afternoon to honor Meadow Pollock. Meadow was one of the 17 victims in the deadly school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School last month. Her father says living without her has been difficult beyond belief. She was an all-American girl. She could fish. She could hunt. I'm miserable every single day, you know, like someone poured gasoline on me and lit me on fire. That's how I could explain the pain that I get every day. I just want him to feel, you know, loved and sees that the support of the community is coming together to back him up. The group held a prayer vigil, sang a song, and had a moment of silence before the Pollock family led the ride in a pickup truck. The ride raised money to help build a playground in Meadows' honor. And New right now, a shark seriously hurts a man, prompting a beach closure. Hawaii officials say the victim was hurt on Kuko Beach. Now part of Big Island Beach is closed. Hawaii County firefighters airlifted the 25-year-old to a hospital with several injuries to his hand and leg. A decision will be made tomorrow morning whether to reopen the beach. And take a look at this. It may look like a floaty, but it's not. The Sarasota County Sheriff's Office tweeted out a photo of this. An 11-foot alligator in a pool Friday night. They say it broke through the screen porch and headed into the water there. An animal trapper eventually pulled it out. And speaking of amazing animal sightings, Gaston and I made some new friends today as we were walking this morning. A dolphin came up to greet us. I see right there. This is the first time Gaston has actually ever seen a dolphin, so he was a little intrigued by the whole thing. And Luckily, he did not bark. He's a good dog. So. You know, if they really do become friends, it's going to go viral. You're going to have, you know, <laughs> this cute dog and the dolphin just friends, you know, on the right. Hatchet. I think so. Gaston can handle the fame. <laughs> oh, he, he's made for it, right? Born and raised in the Born sky. Born <laughs> for sure. Uh, Easter Sunday looking very nice. You take your dog for a walk in the morning. Go. Uh, go check out those dolphins once again. But we will not see any rain tomorrow morning. Expect a dry start for your Easter Sunday. Partly cloudy sky. A few of our communities can actually even be mostly sunny. High temperatures will be back in the 80s, mainly after 1 p.m., but at 1 p.m., we will see 82 degrees. Partly cloudy, pleasant still with us, and we are seeing the uh, cloud cover increase slightly. We may see a mostly cloudy afternoon with a few showers, then popping up late afternoon, early evening. Temperatures still in the lower 80s, expected to come 5 p.m., but let's go hour by hour throughout your evening.